we're lucky to have a choir director who's a marvel on the piano too. Dear God, we have a hard word in front of us today. Help us to shovel out of our way those things that might keep us from understanding the call that Jesus has for us to rethink just about everything. Amen. Don't think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. People's enemies will be members of their own households. Okay. <laughs> Most people don't preach on this. And before you write it off as too disturbing, let me fill in the background. You always have to fill in the background. So days or weeks before Jesus shares this uh, really dark teaching, he had, uh, he had called into being a, a new religious movement, community, and he'd chosen members to serve as the core of that community, the 12 disciples. Then Jesus and his leadership team head to his hometown in Nazareth, and here there's a moment of celebration, uh, which is quickly followed by serious conflict because of what he says. Uh, the very people who should have been uh, those who best understood him <clears throat> and most joyfully welcomed uh, this new prophet don't understand him. People were saying his teaching is too hard. He's gone out of his mind. So to address this problem, Jesus' mother and brothers go to his home in Capernaum. He's picked up roots. He's left his community in Nazareth, moved to Capernaum, right on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. It's a beautiful location. And they want to take him away, straighten him out. And when Jesus is told that they've arrived, he's busy teaching. So he pauses his lesson and asks rhetorically, who are my mother and my brothers? And he looks at those who were with him and says, here are my mother and brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Now, these are disconcerting words if you are part of his family. They seem, in fact, to be directly counter to the teaching of the law, capital L, because the fifth commandment says, honor your father and your mother. There's also a stern warning about this in the book of Deuteronomy. Here, here is how it, it reads there. If someone has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his father and mother, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the town at the gate of that place. And they shall say to the elders of the town, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He's a glutton and a drunkard. And then all the men of the town shall stone him to death. Rather extreme. Jesus was making the radical point that his kind of community may matter even more than birthright and family ties. This is the type of new thinking, in fact, that the Apostle Paul, who of course comes later, speaks of when he says, quote, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for you are all one in Christ. Very radical teaching. I wonder why the Southern Baptist Convention never read that. <laughs> Since they've decided that women are different and are not to be teachers. Jesus is trying to redefine all relationships, including family, in terms of living under God in a broader community than just one's biological roots. Well, the last 50 years has seen a tremendous revolution in what I mean, excuse me, in what it means uh, to be family, right? Today, we have blended families, patchwork families, adoptive families. We have families that skip the parent generation entirely, where there are just grandparents and kids. We have nuclear families that live in separate houses, as well as divorced families that nest together in the same place. We have families with one parent, 
two parents, half a dozen parents in some cases in the Mormon West, and some families with no parents at all. Jesus knew how powerful families are in our lives, whether they are working well or not at all, whether we have snuggled down deep in the bosom of them or somewhere in the middle. Well, the, the, uh, more background here. The first century Palestinian family Jesus was familiar with was, was often pretty large and, and, uh, and extended in interesting ways. It consisted of a father and all his children, including his married sons and all their families, and they would all be living in one place uh, under one roof if possible. In fact, the ideal marriage partner for you, if you lived in Jesus' day, would be one of your first cousins. Now, review your first cousins with me. <laughs> that may sound odd, but look, what better way could you bind an already close-knit family even more tightly together, right? And look, this is the point of marriage at that time. The resultant mentality of that, therefore, is our family against every other one. So, so, to marry anyone other than a family member, if you own property in Jesus' day, was unthinkable, right? To sever all family ties the way the prodigal son does in Jesus' parable is not only stupid, it's, it's, it's tantamount to suicide. I mean, outside the family, nobody could be trusted in Jesus' day. No one will help you do anything. That's what the renegade son in that parable found out when his inheritance ran out, right? So you can see why Jesus' re Jesus's remarks about dividing family members uh, was unthinkable. Now, consider this from the point of view of the people who attended Matthew, the gospel writer's church, you know, to hear this teaching. Those who were hearing how radical it was right there. Now, many of them were probably okay with it. I'm, I'm telling you that because of special circumstances about those communities. In most cases, these were people these first Christians, so to speak, were folks who were estranged from their families. A little more background. In Roman times, it was the custom of whole households to adopt the faith of the head of the household. Everyone in the family was compelled to follow the lead of the leader. Spouses, children, servants, everyone. So if one of the underlings in the family decided to become a Christian, it was nothing short of mutiny. Especially since becoming a Christian had all sorts of consequences. It might mean beginning to associate with a whole, a whole new lower class of people that included outlaws and slaves. It might mean bringing the whole household under the scrutiny of the local magistrate from, from the Roman Empire. There were plenty of people sitting in Matthew's congregation who'd heard this story, who were hearing the story, right? And they'd already been shown the door by their families for following Jesus. Some of them were maybe even Roman soldiers. So, so when Matthew told them what Jesus said about hating their families, it didn't frighten them like it does us. They found comfort in those words, just as they found new family among the others sitting around them. It was as though Jesus had known what would happen to them and reassured them ahead of time. So, we live in a different world today, but, but we still have, you know, a deep genetic desire for kinship, right? Some of us find this in our families, and some of us just don't. For some, the support we need to survive comes from people outside our families, Consider then that this business of church is in no small degree here to take up the slack in a world where we move around so much or are separated from family for a number of reasons, right? Statistics say that, you know, the, the church is 
is an institution that is shrinking. But a, a church that tries its best to be like Matthew's church, it's more important now than ever. We, we just need to be open to new ways of defining what it means to be family. Now, I spoke about this just a couple of weeks ago when I focused on the, the wonderful welcoming church in Denver that was uh, full, to burst, full to bursting with LGBTQ plus people, many of whom were, were on the outs with their biological families. But let me say this as a follow-up. I'm dropping the other shoe here. Let me say that the church also exists to do what it can to help the many traditional families who are often the core of congregational life. Their lives are often just as fraught as everyone else's. Times are, are tough. So, so that being true, I'd like to, to pass on to you the best advice I know for enhancing family togetherness and belonging. It comes from a book called Secrets of a Happy Family by Bruce Failer. And in that book, Failer takes on many challenging subjects, including the difficult issue of the family dinner. And here's what he says. It is like the big boogeyman in families today. Everybody has heard that family dinner is great for kids, but unfortunately, it doesn't work in many of our lives. Well, guess what? Dig deeper into the research, and it's very interesting. It turns out there's only 10 minutes of productive conversation in any family dinner. The rest is taken up with get your elbows off the table and pass the ketchup. So what researchers have found is you can take that 10 minutes and put it in any time of the day and get that benefit. So if you can't have family dinner, have family breakfast. Even one meal a week on a weekend has the same benefit. And it turns out, I'm still reading uh, Bruce, and it turns out in many ways that what you talk about at these times of togetherness is even more important than, than what you eat. Researchers at Emory University gave children a do you know test. Do you know where your grandparents were born? Do you know where your parents went to high school? Do you know any member of your family who had an illness or something terrible that happened to them that they overcame? If your grandparent, what are your, grand, what are your grandkids, do they know these things? Children who scored highest on the do you know test had higher self-esteem and a greater sense of control over their own lives. In fact, the do you know test was the single biggest predictor of emotional health. If you tell your own story to your children, that includes your positive moments and your negative moments, and how you overcame them or are trying to, you give your children the skills and the confidence they need to feel that they can overcome some hardships that they run into too. The family story that uh, we and my family are most proud of is the story of a cousin of mine who died five years ago at the age of 88. She's actually more of an aunt than a cousin. Without going deep into her story, I'll just say that in 1980, this is 42, three years ago, right? At the age of 50, living in the jungle in one of the regions of the Amazon River, she lost her husband and only child, a daughter, to a terrible strain of malaria, a strain which she also contracted and survived. Then, all alone, she survived for five more months, alone, until those who regularly supplied that family unit with staples found her, having been unaware of her predicament. I will add to that, she was legally blind and legally deaf since childhood. My daughter grew up with that story as an assurance that there was a vital strength in our family line, people she could be fiercely proud to call her own. What story do you have in your extended family that you could tell your grandchildren 
or your children that they really need to know. It doesn't have to be a story of survival um, to give a sense of belonging to a family. Uh, it might just answer the question, quote, what were grandma and grandpa like when they were children? How did they survive World War II? Let me share one more family story. This one has some moral heft to it. I have twice in my life been fortunate to spend time with Arun Gandhi, who is the grandson of the great uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Arun died just seven weeks ago, and that's one reason he's on my mind. He spoke uh, in both times I saw him um, of the summers he'd spent with his grandfather. But the most memorable story he told was actually in regard to his own father, uh, not his grandfather. And here's how he told it. Uh, if you don't remember anything else this morning, this, this, this is good. Arun's father was the son of Mahatma Gandhi. And he raised his son Arun and his other children in South Africa, where he worked for justice in the Mahatma's name, using the Mahatma's, the Mahatma's moral techniques. Now, when it came to disciplining their children, Arun's parents raised their children using acts of penance for leverage. Uh, let me explain. They would fast for the misdeeds of their children. If the children misbehaved, the parents would sit with them at dinner, but not eat themselves. And Arun said it worked. Watching his parents go to bed hungry had a huge effect on him. Well, one day when he was 16, his father wasn't feeling his best, but he had an all-day meeting in the South African city of Durban, and needed to go anyway, so he asked his son to drive him. Arun was really glad to. His father made a list of things that Arun was to do in the town, which is 18 miles from home. The ashram where they lived was boring for a 16-year-old, and it stood alone in sugarcane fields with nothing between them and the city, so any excuse to get to go to the city was thrilling for a young man like Arun. Well, he dropped his father at the hotel where his father had his meeting, and Arun quickly did the things his father asked him to do, including taking the car to be serviced. After that, he went to a double feature John Wayne Western film in a movie theater. He was totally engrossed. It let out at 5.30 p.m., but he had agreed to pick his father up at 5. So when he collected the car and his father, his father, who'd been pacing worriedly in front of the hotel, asked his son where he had been. Arun said the car was late in being serviced, so he had to wait for it. But his father, who had called the garage, knew this was not true. <laughs> so he said to his son these words, There must be something wrong in the way I brought you up, if you aren't comfortable enough with me to tell me the truth about such a thing. Let me say that again. There must be something wrong in the way I brought you up if you aren't comfortable enough with me to tell me the truth about such a thing. So as penance, his father walked home the entire 18 miles. Arun said it took until midnight for the two of them to get home. He crept along, driving the car behind his walking father, shining the headlights on beyond his father so his father could see to walk in the pitch dark. Arun said he had to watch his father suffer the whole way home and determined never to lie again. He said he remembered it as if it was yesterday and it had been over 60 years. You know, a story like that told with tenderness and genuineness, can make a tremendous difference in a family. 
You don't need to adopt the strategy or even like it. But look, it stands like a rock that says raising our children to tell the truth is paramount. You know, in a world like this one, where the telling the truth is considered by so many to be less and less valuable, that can make a tremendous difference. So take a minute again. Think a little. What do you know story do you have that you could share with someone close to you that might make a huge difference in what they might think of themselves. We talk about legacy kind of glibly. Legacies are made of storytelling. Stories just like this that are in everybody's extended family. Amen.